Hello everyone. I would like to begin by acknowledging the continued connection of Indigenous Australians to the land, a connection that stretches back tens of thousands of years. Most of us are joining this seminar today from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. And I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that might be joining us here today. Uh, welcome to Alyssa Robbins's PhD completion seminar. This study began for Alyssa um, many years ago after highly productive roles as a research assistant at the Children's Cancer Institute in New South Wales and then the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. And I recall thinking after our first virtual meeting, which was actually the first of many as it turned out, that, that here's a person who's really got it together. She had a clear view of why she wanted a PhD, the type of science that she wanted to learn and then where she was planning to go with it next. And everything she's done since has just reinforced that view for me. And I've also learned many other qualities that Alyssa has. She's highly technically proficient, hardworking and thoughtful. And she already has produced a first author, a joint first author paper from her PhD, and there are more on the way. Um, and Alyssa has a broad command of the literature because her work it spans, as you'll see, it spans a wide breadth of T cell biology, and she's immersed herself in that literature. She's also fearless. So you'll see that she has an appetite to tackle controversies in the field and make new insights along the way. She's also something of a minimalist when it comes to experimental design, communication and writing. And she only kept, tells you what's needed to extract and communicate the key information. And that's something I quite like about Alyssa. Now, despite being from New South Wales, Alyssa has adopted a Victorian obsession for coffee, uh, even to the point of sacrificing her lab mates to the traffic on Royal Parade. I won't go into any details, but suffice it to say, when it came down to a choice between alerting her friends to imminent danger or taking a sip of coffee, she chose the latter. Everyone was fine, but we learned a great deal about Alyssa in that moment as well. Now, this coffee obsession goes even further. Alyssa used lockdown number two to become a self-taught barista, and she claims that this is going to be her backup career if the whole science gig doesn't work out. However, as you were about to see, this backup will not be necessary. So over to you, Alyssa. Um, thank you, Daniel, for that generous introduction. <laughs> um, so today I'm going to be talking about a couple of the projects that I've been walking, working on over the course of my PhD. Um, and both projects, um, these projects are quite different, um, but they both relate back to this theme um, of cell death in the T cell compartment. Um, in the context of differentiation and homeostasis. So like all immune cells, T cells are derived from the hematopoietic stem cells in the bone marrow. And the cells of the adaptive immune system, like B cells and T cells, are derived from the common lymphoid lineage. The role of T cells in the adaptive immune response in the body is to respond to infection by pathogens. Um, so T cells become activated when they recognize um, antigenic peptides on antigen presenting cells. And this activation leads to um, rounds of clonal pro uh, proliferation um, in a process called clonal expansion and also differentiation into affected T cells. Uh, T cells mediate uh, its immune clearance through cell mediated, cell mediated immunity and also by um, cooperating with B cells to mediate humoral immunity or the release of antibodies. Following um, the elimination of any pathogens, um, T cells, the T cell compartment undergoes contraction to, res, uh, to return to homeostasis, and this is through apoptosis. However, some T cells remain and differentiate further into memory T cells. And this activation, clonal expansion and differentiation of T cells is a process mediated by the T cell receptor. So the T cell receptor or TCR is comprised of two chains, the alpha and beta chains. Uh, and these complex with CD3, and a co-receptor, either CD4 or CD8, to initiate signaling to drive this proliferation, differentiation in cell survival. However, the T cell, T cell receptor itself, the alpha and beta chains, uh, their role is to recognize the foreign antigen that's presented by MHC class one or class two molecules on anti antigen presenting cells. Because the immune system needs to be able to respond to a variety of pathogens over our lifetimes, there are a couple of highly desirable traits in, T in a T cell receptor repertoire that ensures a fully functioning adaptive immune system. So the first is that we want a TCR that's functionally competent 
So it's able to pair with CD3 and the co-receptor and induce downstream signaling pathways to drive activation and proliferation in response to recognizing an antigen. Secondly, um, it's desirable to have a high variability in the TCRs that are generated, as having many different TCR sequences as possible allows the body to respond to any number of pathogens. And finally, you want a TCR that responds only to foreign antigens and not self, uh, as this present, prevents the um, development of autoimmune conditions. And these desirable traits in the TCR repertoire are all programmed during T cell differentiation in the thymus. So I've already spoken a little bit about how, TCR, uh, how T cell differentiation in the peripheral lymphoid organs, such as the spleen, lymph node and blood, occurs in response to activation through the T cell receptor. However, the majority of what we call T cell differentiation occurs in the thymus. Um, so the thymus and its role in T cell differentiation were first described by Jacques Miller. And T cells are unique among the immune subsets and that they have their own organ for their differentiation. And so T cell differentiation in the thymus is mostly about the generation of a functional, diverse and specific T cell repertoire for the body to fight infections. And this differentiation occurs in several unique stages characterized the, by the surface expression of CD4 and CD8. So the first of these, uh, also known as the triple negative compartment, because they, these uh, thymocytes lack CD4, CD8 and CD3. And these are the earliest progenitors that come from uh, the common lymphoid progenitor from the bone marrow. The second is the CD4, CD8 double positive compartment which express both receptors. And then these will differentiate into either CD8 single positives or CD4 single positives. However, some CD4 positive uh, T cells also uh, differentiate into regulatory T cells. And this subsetting of thymocytes into the TN, DP and SP stages is also a surrogate for where the generation of the T cell receptor is up to. So generation of the TCR starts in the TN2 compartment um, after lineage commitment and cells generate their TCR beta chain first and following this they'll go through a selection process known as beta selection. Following beta selection uh, cells will start to generate their TCR alpha chain in the double positive compartment and cells that can successfully generate both the TCR alpha and beta chains will undergo positive and negative selection in the thymus. And so the reason that uh, these checkpoints exist is due to um, how the TCRs are generated. And this comes back to the desire for variability in the T cell receptor repertoire. So the germline DNA for the TCR alpha and beta genes, and I'm only showing the beta chain here, but uh, the alpha chain is virtually the same, um, contains multiple segments known as variable joining and diversity segments or VDJ segments. And these are recombined in a process known as VDJ recombination so that the, um, the T cell receptor as it's expressed contains only one of each of these paired with a common beta or alpha chain. Um, and it's estimated that this process has 10 to the 15 possible TCR combinations in a mouse or 10 to the 18 possible combinations in a human that can be generated. And so while this, while this process is overall beneficial uh, because of the variability it allows, there's a couple of um, sort of inherent issues with this process. Um, the first is that it's quite an inefficient process. The majority of thymocytes won't actually be able to generate functional TCR chains. Um, and this is due to how the recombination is so random. So in beta selection, the recombined beta chain is paired with a surrogate pre-T alpha chain. Uh, and only cells that can have successfully generated a functional beta chain will uh, differentiate and proliferate. And the second issue with this process is that uh, it generates a number of double-stranded DNA breaks. And so killing cells that haven't re repaired their DNA properly lowers the likelihood of malignancies. Um, as well as survival at beta selection, the pre-TCR is also reported to play a role in both the proliferation of post-beta selection thymocytes and their differentiation into the DP compartment, just as the TCR mediates these processes in an immune response. And given dysregulation of these processes can cause either immunodeficiencies or malignancies, we were interested in the dynamics 
and role of this checkpoint. However, it's not just during thymic selection that there's a lot of cell death in the T cell uh, compartment. T cells are primed to undergo cell death at all stages of their differentiation, and cell death is essential to maintain homeostasis in the system. T cells in the earliest and latest stages of differentiation are reliant on cytokines to avoid cell death, such as the, the lymphoid progenitors, which are reliant on stem cell factor, the earliest thymocytes, which are reliant on IL-7 signaling, and the more differentiated memory cells, which are reliant on IL-7 and IL-15. In the intermediate stages, thymocytes and immature T cells require uh, signals to their developing TCR or tonic TCR signaling in the periphery to survive. So which cell death pathways are mediating all this death? Uh, in T cells, there's three main cell death pathways we're interested in, intrinsic apoptosis, extrinsic apoptosis, and necroptosis. So in the intrinsic pathway, which is uh, fairly well studied at WEHI, um, at homeostasis, this is moderated by the pro-survival proteins, also known as the BCL2 family proteins. However, cells sense uh, in response to stress or things like cytokine deprivation, cells will uh, transcribe the BH3 only proapoptotic proteins. And these can cause apoptosis, apoptosis either by inhibiting the pro-survival proteins, which would normally inhibit the apoptotic effector proteins, or these BH3 only proteins can directly activate the apoptotic effector proteins as well. And so when the apoptotic effectors, once activated, uh, cause mitochondrial outer membrane permeabilization, release of cytochrome chrome C, which forms the apoptosome with APAF1, and this triggers the caspase cascade that leads to those sort of uh, inherent qualities of apoptosis, such as membrane blebbing and how the cells break down. In contrast, extrinsic apoptosis relies on the binding of death ligands, such as FAS ligand, TRAIL, or TNF, to bind to the death receptors. Um, and this binding results in a conformational change that recruits uh, the adaptive proteins such as FAD to the uh, cytosolic um, end of these receptors. Um, and FAD binding to these receptors also recruits caspase 8 and leads to its dimerization and activation. Uh, and this triggers down downstream caspases and the extrinsic apoptotic pathway. In instances where caspase 8 is not activated or if it's absent, it cannot cleave RIP1. And so when we have inhibited caspase 8 activation, RIP1 gets phosphorylated. It then phosphorylates RIP3, which in turn leads to the phosphorylation of MLKL. And MLKL forms pores in the, um, in the cell surface, and this leads to a lytic form of cell death called necroptosis. And so the mechanisms regulating cell death at most stages of T cell differentiation are already quite well established. And the majority of cell death in homeostatic conditions is regulated by the intrinsic apoptotic pathway. Although the pro-survival and pro-apoptotic pro proteins responsible for cell survival or death differ by differentiation stage. The cell death mechanism governing the beta selection checkpoint, however, remains unclear. And as I touched on before, this is an important checkpoint for cell death in the thymus due to its role in preventing malignancies, which is why we think it's important to study. Um, so I just want to go briefly through how we study T cell differentiation in the thymus by flow cytometry. So the first thing we look at in whole thymocytes is their CD4 and CD8 expression, and this is to subset uh, the, DN, the DN compartment. Um, and cells then differentiate into CD4, CD8 double positives, and then either single CD8 single positives or CD4 single positives. And we can track all this nicely through flow cytometry. Um, so then we can zoom in further on the DN compartment to look at differentiation of the earlier thymocyte subsets. And so if we take those DN thymocytes and also gate on CD3 negative cells, we get the TN compartment. And we can track their differentiation through the IL-2 receptor CD25 and the adhesion molecule CD44. So the earliest TN1 thymocytes start CD4 positive, CD25 negative. They then upregulate CD25 upon lineage commitment. And when they start to down, uh, when they start to 
generate the TCL beta chain, they downregulate CD44 and move into the TN3 compartment. Following beta selection, cells downregulate CD25 and move into the TN4 compartment before becoming um, double positive cells. And we can zoom in even further on this TN3, TN4 compartment and look at differentiation immediately for the following beta selection by looking at expression of the co-receptor CD28. And so when we look at this CD25 versus CD28 plot, we see cells um, immediately prior to beta selection will upregulate CD28 and move from TN3A to TN3B. Following beta selection, again, they'll downregulate CD25. And as they move into the TN4 compartment, they can make one of three choices. They can either keep their 20, CD28 uh, levels relatively stable and only downregulate CD25 further, or they can upregulate or downregulate CD28 expression as well. And so the majority of uh, TN3 thymocytes will simply downregulate CD25 and move into this TN4A compartment. However, a small majority will move into the TN4B or TN4C compartments. Um, the majority of DP cells, though, are derived from this TN4A compartment. And so this is what thymocyte differentiation by facts looks like for a wild-type mice. However, the model I've used to study cell death at beta selection is the RAG knockout mouse, where T-cell differentiation is arrested um, at beta selection. So the reason this occurs is that the RAG1 enzyme is critical for VDJ recombination. So RAG knockout mice lack all mature B and T lymphocytes. And these thymocytes, thymocytes in these mice fail to overcome the beta selection checkpoint, so differentiation is arrested at DN3. So if we look at this by facts, you can see that whereas the wild type cells differentiate from the DN to DP and then single positive compartments, RAG knockout mice have the differentiation arrested in the DP compartment, in the DN compartment, sorry. And again, if we look at CD44 versus CD25, we can see that differentiation is arrested when cells are in the TN3 compartment, but CD25 high. And so just to remind you that my aim for this project was to determine cell death, the cell death mechanism reg regulating the beta selection checkpoint. So like cell death at all the other stages of thymocyte differentiation, this checkpoint has been studied quite a bit before, but there's conflicting evidence implicating both the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways. And all of the studies performed on this checkpoint were published well before necroptosis had actually been discovered as well. So the studies that have looked at the intrinsic pathway of beta selection have all relied on the overexpression of members of the pro-survival protein, um, in particular BCL2 in RAG knockout mice. So this study by the my lab showed that uh, BCL2 transgenic expression under the LCK promoter partially rescued RAG knockout thymocytes from TN3 arrest. Um, so you can see compared to uh, RAG knockout thymocytes, which are arrested in the DN compartment, uh, these mice are able to partially uh, rescue this DP compartment. And also you can see down regulation of CD25 in these TN cells. However, um, a paper published in Andreas's lab um, using again, BCL2 transgene, but this time under the EMU enhancer, was not sufficient to rescue the TN4 thymocyte compartment. And you can see here that these, uh, these cells don't di differentiate into TN4 and downregulate CD25. However, there's only one study looking the, at the extrinsic apoptotic pathway in beta selection in RAG knockout mice. And again, this is from Andreas's lab. Um, so they became interested in this pathway at beta selection because they established that the machinery required for extrinsic apoptosis was expressed in TN3 thymocytes, such as the death ligands, the death receptors, and the, uh, the components of this uh, death-inducing signaling complex. As deletion of caspase 8 or FAD is embryonic lethal, this study utilised a T-cell-specific expression of a dominant negative FAD transgene to inhibit, inf uh, inhibit formation of this uh, signaling complex to inhibit extrinsic apoptosis. So when they expressed the FAD dominant negative transgene in thymocytes on a RAG knockout background, this resulted in them overcoming TN3 risk and uh, a much more, uh, a much better rescue of the DP compartment compared to the LCK transgenic mice. So in these mice, they're able to rescue about 65% of the DP cells compared to about 10% in the LCK uh, BCL2 transgenic mice. 
They also showed differentiation from TN3 to TN4 in these mice. Interestingly, though, not all of the mice expressing the FADDN transgene had detectable numbers of DP thymocytes. So there's a couple here where the DP compartment remained below the level of detection. Further, they also reported that when they aged these mice, thymic lymphomas developed at around 150 days. And you can see how much larger the thymus is in these lymphoma mice compared to age match controls. And when they looked at the the thymocytes from these lymphomas, you can see that they're about 99% CD4, CD8 double positive. Uh, lastly, they performed an experiment where they injected an anti-CD3 antibody into these mice. This is normally sufficient to overcome the TN block in RAG knockout mice. And you can see here that over time, these mice develop DP thymocytes. However, in the RAG knockout FADDN transgenic mice, these thym thymocytes had impaired differentiation into the DP compartment. And you can see this here. And from the cell numbers as well, you can see that the RAG FADDN transgenic thymocytes didn't proliferate to the same extent as the RAG knockout thymocytes. And so this got us interested in a potential role for necroptosis at beta selection, as this, what was initially reported as a defect in proliferation, has also been reported in models where caspase 8 is deleted. Um, and it's since been shown that this is due to induction of necroptosis rather than a deficiency in proliferation. So we wondered if these thymocytes were capable of undergoing necroptosis. So we looked at the expression of MLKL by RNA-seq from data collected by the InGen Consortium, and we found that MLKL is expressed early on in thymocyte differentiation. And while it's down-regulated before uh, in the DN3 compartment, we think that there's possibly sufficient MLKL protein left for these TN3 cells to be able to undergo necroptosis. And so based on the better rescue of DP thymocytes in the RAG knockout FADDN transgenic model of beta selection rescue, compared to the conflicting results of the BCL2 transgenic mice, we hypothesized that cell death receptor mediated apoptosis regulates cell death at the beta selection checkpoint with necroptosis acting as a fail safe mechanism if for some reason apoptosis was inhibited. So the first experiments I started off doing as a PhD student was to generate or to re-derive, sorry, these uh, RAG knockout FADDN transgenic mice from the Newton paper. And we also wanted to generate uh, FADDN transgenic mice that also had the necroptotic effect of protein MLKL knocked out to test our hypothesis about necroptosis acting as a failsafe. And so just a reminder, uh, when we track thymocyte differentiation, we're looking for differentiation for the DN to the DP compartment in this mice, which is blocked in the RAG knockout mouse. And so when we analysed these re-derived RAG knockout FADDN transgenic mice, we saw that this differentiation block was still in place and it couldn't be overcome as Kim had described. And additionally, when we analysed what the mice where MLKL was also deleted, we saw that the same, this same pattern of DN arrest. So next we decided to look in the T TN compartment. And again, just a reminder that of the differentiation of in the TN compartment runs clockwise from the TN1 through TN4 compartments. And again, we saw that in these RAG knockout FADDN transgenic mice, with and without MLKL knockout, we weren't able to overcome beta selection. So we tentatively concluded that our re-derived FADDN transgenic mice did not overcome beta selection due cell death. However, we did want to double check that in re-deriving the line, the FADDN transgene was still expressed and functional. So to check that the transgene was expressed, I performed a Western blot where I looked at um, the flag label that's on the end of uh, the FADDN transgene. And you can see in mice where our genotyping by PCR uh, indicated that the transgene was present, the protein was also present at about 16 kilodaltons, which is what the size we expect of the FADDN transgene. And so having confirmed that the protein was expressed, I next wanted to double check that the transgene was functioning correctly. So I harvested thymocytes from RAG heterozygous mice with and without the FADDN transgene, and also from FAS LPR mice, which contain a sp spontaneous uh, mutation in the FAS receptor that's a loss of function mutation. So they can't undergo apoptosis in response to FAS ligand to act as a negative control. And so I cultured these thymocytes in vitro for 24 hours in the presence of FAS ligand. And while the cells lacking the FADDN transgene were able to undergo apoptosis, uh, in a dose-dependent manner. Expression of the transgene 
uh, as well as the LPR mutation uh, rescued this apoptosis. So we concluded that our FAD-DN system was working. Um, it was present and, uh, and functional. And given these results, we decided to switch models from the FAD-DN transgene to knocking out different components of the extrinsic apoptotic pathway on a RAG knockout background. So we generated two additional models to study the extrinsic pathway. Firstly, by deleting uh, caspase A. Um, and as this is embryonic lethal, as I mentioned, we also had to delete MLKL. Um, and we also generated these mice that were deficient in the, uh, the death ligands. So they don't express TNF or trail, and they express a loss of function uh, form of FAS ligand that can't induce apoptosis. And to hedge our bets, we also crossed the RAG knockout mice to the BCL2 transgenic mouse under the VAV promoter. And so when we analyzed these mice, we were able to confirm that along with the FAD-DN transgenic result, rendering the extrinsic apoptotic pathway inactive was insufficient to generate DP pharmacytes. In contrast, overexpressing the BCL2 transgene resulted in a rescue of the DP compartment, as you can see here. Um, and we do see uh, some CD8 single positive cells. These aren't mature thymocytes. Uh, what they are is actually um, CD8 immature single positive cells. Um, so DN cells, when they differentiate uh, towards, uh, towards the DP compartment, will upregulate CD8 first before they upregulate CD4 and move into this compartment. And so this partial rescue is confirmed when we look at the total number of thymocytes as well. In the mice where we've knocked out the ex extrinsic pathway, there's no increase in the number of thymocytes about, above a RAG knockout background. Conversely, we see the RAG bad BCL2 transgenic mice have a thymus that's roughly half the size of a wild type thymus. So not a complete rescue, but it's over three times larger on average than a RAG knockout thymus. And again, if we look more specifically at TN thymocytes, we can see that the differentiation in mice deficient in the extrinsic pathway is arresting at TN3. But this beta selection arrest is overcome with a BCL2 transgenic expression. So in summary, we've shown that the intrinsic, not extrinsic pathway of apoptosis um, is regulating the beta selection checkpoint. And that BCL2 expression under a VAV promoter is sufficient to rescue thymocytes without a functional pre-TCR from apoptosis. However, um, I'd also drawn now two conclusions that were in direct, direct uh, conflict to what one of my supervisors had previously published, which is not an ideal situation for a PhD student to be in. So I wanted to go back and address why my results were different. Firstly, um, I wanted to address why BCL2 transgene under a VAV or an LCK promoter could rescue, thymus, could rescue thymocytes from TN3 arrest, but not the EMU BCL2 that Andreas had used. And secondly, I needed to address why my RAG knockout FAD DN transgenic mice didn't develop DP thymocytes or thymic lymphomas as Kim had described. So to address this first question, um, I performed facts on thymocytes from mice using where they had either the EMU BCL2 transgene or the VAV BCL2 transgene. And we compared these to our RAG knockout VAV BCL2 transgenic mice. And you can see that the EMU BCL2 transgene is expressed uh, early in thymocyte differentiation, so around lineage commitment in TN2, which should be sufficient for it. Um, to overcome beta selection if indeed the amount was sufficient. However, you can see that across the board, the VAV BCL2 transgene levels were much higher. Um, and this is quantified along the bottom as well. And what we also noticed that was when we looked at the RAG knockout VAV BCL2 transgene compared to VAV BCL2 transgenic expression on a wild type background, this was consistently lower in the TN compartment, um, but this um, reversed in the DP compartment. And this in combination with the EMU uh, BCL2 levels led us, to confer, uh, led us to conclude that there's a threshold level of transgenic BCL2 expression required to inhibit apoptosis in TN3 thymocytes lacking a functional pre-TCR. And so this just left working out why my rederived bad DN transgenic mice weren't developing DP thymocytes. Um, and fortunately, this kind of took care of itself. So um, late last year, the first mouse in this colony, which was 321, came down with a thymic lymphoma. And we had a couple of others that followed soon after. And when we tracked them back, 
uh, by their parents, which we noticed that it all come from the same father, number 197, who was uh, sitting on the shelf still perfectly healthy. Um, and we've since had another parental line start to develop these thymic lymphomas as well. And however, we noticed, um, as Kim had described, only the mice that have the FADDN transgene come downwards with, thym with this thymocyte. Um, sorry, thymic lymphoma phenotype. Um, so in mice that don't express the FADDN transgene, uh, they're perfectly healthy. And we've got a lot more siblings that don't express the FADDN transgene from this line to come to analyze. And so when we compared the offspring of 197 to other mice that had the FADDN transgene, but didn't die of lymphomas, um, they died of other causes such as routine harvest or death due to infections, which these mice are particularly prone to. We noticed that the FADDN transgenic mice were uh, developing lymphomas um, significantly earlier than the other mice were dying. And you can see the, the size of the thymus and spleen in these lymphoma mice compared to age match wild type controls. And so um, I just happened to harvest a couple of mice from 197's uh, parental line just before they came down with uh, thymic lymphomas. And you can see that these mice are rescue, uh, producing DP thymocytes, rescuing that compartment, just as Kim saw. So given our results, as well as the data Kim published about this phenotype, we think that these col colonies are generating a, spo a spontaneous mutation that either cooperates with the FADDN transgene to drive this CD4, CD8 dual positive lymphoma, or a mutation arises that's sufficient to drive this phenotype alone. Either way, the mutation must be located in close proximity to where the FADDN transgene has integrated into the genome. As the transgene and development of the thymic T-cell lymphomas haven't segregated over more than 10 generations. And so we've frozen down um, thymocytes from the mice that have died of thymic lymphomas, and we plan to perform whole exome sequencing on these to determine what this mutation is. So having answered this uh, initial question we had about which pathway was regulating thymocyte apoptosis at beta selection, we next wanted to ask whether the thymocytes in our RAG knockout that BCL2 transgenic mice that we'd rescued from cell death were proliferating after surviving TN3 arrest um, before they differentiated into the TN4 and DP compartment. And the reason we wanted to address this was due to a paper that was published previously that suggested that the pre-TCR induced proliferation was necessary for differentiation into the DP compartment. So in this paper, they deleted the transcription factor MIC using an LCK creep. And when they sorted uh, pre-beta selection thymocytes and cultured these in vitro, in mice where MIC had been deleted, they weren't able to proliferate and they also weren't able to differentiate into the DP compartment. Rather than culturing cells in vitro, we wanted to address this in vivo. So we utilized an EDU pulse method of detecting proliferation. So EDU is a thymidian analog that gets incorporated into the DNA of replicating cells, as you can see here. And so we injected uh, wild type VABBCL2 transgenic on a wild type background and RAG knockout VABBCL2 transgenic mice with EDU. Um, we waited four hours and then we harvested the thymus. And then we stained these uh, with our cell surface antibodies and also performed this clip chemistry reaction that uh, inserts a, a fluorophore, in our case, Pacific blue, onto the end of these EDU that's been incorporated in the proliferating cells. And we ran these um, on a flow cytometer. Um, so just as a, a bit of a reminder, what we're looking at here um, is CD25 versus CD28. And so the populations that we're interested in are the TN3B cells immediately prior to beta selection, TN3C cells immediately post beta selection, and the TN4A and TN4C cells. Um, we didn't look at the TN4B cell, uh, sorry, yeah, TN4B cells because they didn't um, appear in either of these two genotypes. And so when we look at this proliferation in a wild type mouse, you can see that overall these cells are sort of proliferating moder moderately except in the TN3C compartment immediately after beta selection where uh, proliferation is much higher. And when we look at the VABBCL2 transgenic mice, we can see that uh, across the board, this proliferation is lower. Um, and this is not an unexpected result because the VABBCL2 transgene, as it's rescuing cells that would have died, um, 
it, these cells are slower to enter uh, the cell cycle. So proliferation uh, starts off a bit slower, but then proceeds normally. However, when we looked at the RAG knockout VAB BCL2 transgenic mice, you can see that across the board, there's no proliferation going on in these thymocytes. Um, and this is just confirming this by uh, the, uh, sorry, just by graphing it. Um, so you can see that for both the wild type and VAB BCL2 transgenic mice, proliferation peaks in this post beta selection DN3C compartment, but the RAG knockout VAB BCL2 transgenic mice aren't proliferating. So we concluded that proliferation is not actually necessary for TN3 to TN4 differentiation following beta selection. Um, and having shown this, uh, we sort of came back to this sort of fundamental question about, well, what is the role of the beta selection checkpoint? Um, is it really a differentiation checkpoint, seeing as we can force cells to differentiate even if they're not proliferating and in the absence of a pre-TCR? And if the pre-TCR isn't required for differentiation, what's actually regulating differentiation during the TN to DP transition? And so with our RAG knockout for BCL2 transgenic mice, we've now got a really nice model where we can separate out the role of the pre-TCR in survival and presumably proliferation and focus instead purely on what's regulating differentiation. And so to address this, we've planned a bulk RNA-seq experiment where we will sort pre and post beta selection thyme sites um, and also more differentiated TN4, CD8 ISP and double positive thymocytes from wild type and our RAG knockout by BCL2 transgenic mice. And so we can compare the differentially expressed genes between these populations in our RAG knockout by BCL2 transgenic mice to determine which pathways are regulating differentiation. And we can compare the, the same population between the wild type and the BCL2 transgenic mice to determine which pathways are regulated by the pre-TCR. And so having shown that the intrinsic apoptotic pathway regulates survival at beta selection in the thymus, um, I'm now gonna spend the second part of my talk discussing some work we've been doing again, uh, looking at cell death mechanisms, but this time in regulatory T cells um, in the periphery and how we can utilize their control of T cell homeostasis for therapeutic utility. So FOXP3 positive regulatory T cells um, have a role in the body and that's to regulate immune homeostasis by suppressing the activation of conventional CD4 and CD8 T cells. And so they differentiate, as I mentioned before, from conventional cells in the thymus and they're characterized by the expression of the transcription factor FOXP3, which is essential for maintaining their suppressive functions. Dysregulation of Treg numbers in humans results in a number of disease pathologies. Um, for example, localized increases of Tregs in tumors inhibits the tumor suppressive functions of the immune system. And conversely, decreased numbers or dysfunction of Tregs can result in autoimmune diseases. So one of the ways that Tregs mediate the immune homeostatic system is through the IL-2, IL-2 receptor signaling access. access. Um, so under homeostatic conditions, Tregs express high levels of the IL-2 receptor CD25. And so they have a higher affinity for the limiting IL-2 in the system compared to the conventional T cells. And this results in um, IL-2 suppression. Upon activation of a T cell clone, the conventional cells undergo clonal expansion and differentiate into effector cells and begin releasing excess IL-2 back into the system. And this re results in increased survival and proliferation of the Treg compartment and enhanced suppression of the conventional compartment. And so this leads to um, contraction and shutdown of this um, conventional compartment, which then re reduces the amount of IL-2 in the system, returning it to a limiting IL-2 condition. And this IL-2 deficiency in the system leads to apoptosis of the Treg, so the system returns to homeostasis. For a long time, there's been interest in manipulating the Treg compartment for therapeutic utility. And most of these efforts have been focused on increasing Treg numbers. So there's currently clinical trials for adoptive Treg therapies for transplant recipients and autoimmune diseases. And there's also, uh, they've also started to develop CAR Tregs um, to treat autoimmune diseases. And these are also in clinical trials. 
However, our lab has been focused on whether we can manipulate our knowledge of cell death pathways to inhibit T-Reg survival and force the system in the other way. And so we wanted to know if we could um, increase apoptosis in T-Regs, whether this would increase the activated effect of T-cell populations and whether we could use this to treat chronic viral infections or improve responses to cancer immunotherapies. So the first cell death pathway we sought to manipulate was the intrinsic apoptotic pathway. As we know, Tregs is reliant on the BCL2 pro-survival family protein and CL1. And so we're able to delete MCL1 specifically in Tregs by intercrossing an MCL1 FOX mouse to a FOXP3 cream mouse. Um, and this in vivo work was completed by Karis. So when MCL1 is deleted in Tregs, there's a significant reduction in the Treg compartment measured here by FOXP3 and CD25 in these MCL1 FOXP3 cream mouse mice compared to wild type controls in both the spleen and the lymph node. And these mice go on to develop a lethal lymphoinfiltrative disease with a multi-organ pathology. And you can see the abundance of lymphocytes and the tissue destruction in the, the lung, pancreas and saliva again, H and E slides here. Um, we're also able to show that loss of the apoptotic effect of proteins back and backs was able to rescue this, uh, this lethal phenotype, showing that this is due to the, um, the pro-apoptotic, uh, sorry, pro-survival role of MCL1. And as this is the Treg specific deletion of MCL1, we wanted to know what, what happens in conventional cells and whether they're similarly sensitive to MCL1 loss or if there's a therapeutic window we could exploit here. And so we utilize a small molecule inhibitor, S63845, which is a potent and specific inhibitor of MCL1. And S63845 belongs to a class of drugs known as BH3 mimetics, uh, of which venetoclax is also a member, which mimic the proapoptotic BH3 only proteins to induce apoptosis. So we treated human uh, Tregs and conventional cells from PBMCs um, in vitro with S63845 uh, for 24 hours and we're able to show that regulatory t-cells have a um, an order of magnitude more or an order of magnitude more sensitive to mcl1 inhibition than conventional cells and you can see this most particularly at the one micromolar dose here and we're also able to show that human and mouse t-regs are similarly sensitive to mcl1 inhibition um, if anything the the human regulatory t-cells shown here on the left are slightly more sensitive to um, MCL1 inhibition, uh, but this is probably due to the, the affinity of S63845 to the human homologue of MCL1 compared to the mouse homologue. And we're also able to show that um, this drug was acting on target in um, even at doses up to 10 micromolar in mice because when we knocked out the apoptotic effectors back alone or back and backs, we're able to rescue this, um, this defect in cell viability. Um, so while Tregs are more sensitive to MCL1 inhibition than conventional cells, we we're also um, sort of disappointed to see that B cells were even more sensitive. Um, and you can see this here on the right. And we're a little bit worried that this B cell sensitivity might limit the utility of MCL1 inhibition of Tregs. Um, so I've shown that Tregs are more sensitive to MCL1 inhibition than conventional T cells. However, these experiments were all carried out in a homeostatic system. Um, so we wanted to know what happens in an infection setting. And we haven't actually done this um, for this MCL1 model yet. But one model where we have done it is looking at extrinsic apoptosis and necroptosis in t -rogues. Um And so we've generated mice that are deficient for caspase A in the t -rogue compartment. Um, and as caspase 8 is required to inhibit necroptosis by cleaving with 1, loss of caspase 8 in Tregs should drive cell death through necroptosis. And so again, we utilize the FOXP3 cream mouse. Um, this time we cross it to a caspase 8 flox allele to delete caspase 8 in Tregs. And this mouse work again was completed by Karis and in collaboration with Simon Preston from Mark Pellegrini's lab. And we noticed somewhat surprisingly that in naive mice where we deleted caspase 8 um, in T-Rex, uh, compared to control mice, they actually had an expansion of the T-Rex compartment. However, when these mice were injected 
uh, infected, sorry, with a docile strain of the LCMV virus, which induces a chronic um, infection state, uh, the T-ray compartment in these mice diminished. And you can see this both in the proportion and the number of uh, T-regs in these Caspase-8 FOXP3 LCMV mice. In, a, in line with our hypothesis that decreasing the T-ray compartment would result in an increased com uh, conventional T-cell compartment in response, uh, we're able to see that both in CD4 and CD8 T-cells, this affected compartment uh, measured here by CD62L and CD44 was, uh, was much, oh, sorry, was expanded in the Caspase 8 FOXP3 mice compared to control mice. And this is due to an increase in proliferation as measured here by KI67. And so this decrease in Tregs is relative to the expansion of affected T cells can also be expressed as a ratio of uh, FOXP3 to affected T cells, sorry, Tregs to affected T cells. And you can see again that in both the CD4 and CD8 compartments, um, deletion of caspase-8 under the FOXP3 Cree results uh, in a decrease in the, the relative numbers of Tregs. However, this was able to be rescued by deletion of MLKL showing that this um, this defect in the T cell in the T reg compartment is a result of necroptosis. And this sensitivity to necroptosis during infection is due to type 1 interferons such as interferon beta, which are typically re uh, released in response to viral infections. Um, and you can see for both the T conventional cells and the T reg cells, in response to stimulation with interferon beta, MLKL is upregulated. However, we also noticed that in the T-reg compartment in the unstimulated cells, the MLKL expression was higher than in the T-conventional compartment. And again, so we wondered if there was a therapeutic window we could exploit here. And so to address this, we utilized uh, the caspase inhibitor Emricosan. And while this drug is a pan-caspase inhibitor, it was initially developed to inhibit apoptosis in liver diseases such as NASH and cirrhosis. John Silk's lab have used it um, and has shown that it inhibits caspase-8 sufficiently to induce necroptosis in AML. And so we treated human PBMCs with interferon beta to upregulate MLKL expression, as well as TNF and increasing concentrations of Enricosan for 48 hours to induce necroptosis. Uh, and you can see uh, this, uh, this decrease in the proportion and also number of Tregs. And what we were also able to show is that when we added the RIP1 inhibitor, NEC1, which inhibits necroptosis, we were able to rescue this, um, this phenotype. Um, and this is quantified over here on the right. And we also wanted to know whether conventional T cells were sensitive to embrocosan induced necroptosis. And so the answer was yes, but again, not as sensitive as Tregs. So in the, the CD4 T, T conventional compartment, um, the subsets we look at here are effector um, cells, memory cells, and naive T cells. And you can see that while there's a slight decrease in both the effector and memory compartments, overall, uh, looking at the numbers of CD4 T cells, they didn't change, or if anything, they slightly increased in some of these higher doses of Enricosan. Um, and that's possibly related to the decrease in the Treg numbers. Um, in contrast, the CD8 T conventional cells seem to be a bit more sensitive to necroptosis. Um, so we're looking at the effector cells here that are CCR negative versus the naive cells. Um, and you can see that this effector compartment does diminish. However, um, looking at the number of cells per well, again, you can see that this isn't uh, the same level of cell death as what we see with the, the T-Rex compartment. Again, could be rescued by adding NEC1. Um, so what I've shown here is that Tregs are more sensitive than conventional T cells to both MCL1 inhibition and necroptosis after caspase-8 inhibition. However, the clinical utility of an MCL1 inhibitor hasn't been investigated in an infection model. And so targeting Treg necroptosis is an attractive proposition due to the relative sensitives, sensitivities of conventional and regulatory T cells and the fact that we've been able to show this, um, this works in an infection setting as well. And so overall, what I've shown today is that cell death plays an important role in ensuring the development of a functional immune system and preventing malignancies. 
and better understanding how this regulation of cell death during T cell differentiation, um, how this, uh, this works, we can uh, hopefully develop opportunities for treating defects in T cell development or differentiation um, or function. And harnessing our knowledge of how cell death is differentially, differentially mediated in different immune subsets also affords us opportunities to manipulate um, immune homeostasis for therapeutic utility. Um, and so this just leaves me with my acknowledgements. Um, first and foremost, my supervisors, Daniel, Andreas and Karis, for all their support during my PhD. Um, I really lucked out on my supervisors. Um, Daniel sort of mentioned that we had a, a Skype chat when I was still in Boston at the start of the talk. Um, I actually only had one, one Skype call with Daniel from Boston and half a dozen emails backwards and forwards before I agreed to take on a PhD with him uh, or before he agreed to take me on as a PhD student. Um, but they've always been really supportive um, of me during my PhD. Um, they've been super generous with their time and expertise. Um, and they've also allowed me to explore some option uh, outside of science. Um, including letting me do two internships during my PhD. Um, to my PhD committee, Mark, John and Andrew, thank you for all your support. Um, I've always really enjoyed my, my committee meetings. I know some PhD students dread them, but I've always really enjoyed the really great scientific conversations we've had um, and the ideas for experiments that came out of them. Um, to the Grey Lab members, past and present, um, thank you for making coming to work every day a real joy even when science wasn't working so well and work just kind of sucked. Um, thank you for all your support, um, all the coffee chats. Um, as Daniel mentioned, um, I do quite enjoy my coffee um, and Julie, Melanie and Antonia especially. Um, we've got a lot of coffee together and I've really enjoyed the chats and the friendship that's developed out of this. Um, I've been lucky during my time at WeHi to be part of two really great divisions. Um, firstly, NGC, where I spent the first two years of my PhD, and also the immun immunology division, where I spent the second half. Um, so thank you to everyone in these divisions for all your support. Um, just random chats around the lab, er, around the lab and um, being really generous with time and reagents and everything. Um, to our collaborators, collaborators at WeHi, um, Simon Preston and the Pellegrini Lab for the Treg Necroptosis projects um, and Lorraine, Sarah, Gemma and Grant Dewson for the TREG MCO1. Uh, they did some experiments for the, that really helped us get this paper out the door. Um, and our other collaborators on this TREG MCO1 story were Mark and Darren from the Baker Institute and Sarah Gabriel from the Doherty. Um, as you can see from all of my projects today, uh, we're really reliant on our bioservices team um, to look after all our mice. Um, so Haley, Tracy, Carmen and Kate have all been responsible for my mice at different times. Um, but I wanted to give a particular shout out to Haley because these rag knockout mice are not fun to deal with. Um, we've had a couple of outbreaks of pastorella and um, she's been monitoring them for like three years as well to look for developments of lymphomas. Um, and she's been just incredibly diligent with how she's gone about all of the mouse handling um, and looking after these mice. And also to Jackie and Steve, the vets, um, for helping us to manage these, um, the pastorella outbreaks and other issues we've had. Um, to people that have given me mice um, to, to generate my, my models um, for the projects we discussed today, um, Philippe, Sylvia, John, uh, for the mice that I use for the beta selection story, and Ben Kyle and Alexander Rodensky for mice that, um, for the MCL1 T reg story. Um, I also got some reagents off Najwa and Christine for these stories today, so thank you for that. Um, to Simon and his team in the Weehi Fax facility, thank you for keeping all of the machines in such great condition um, and all of the help with the fax sorts and panel designs and stuff that I've needed help with along the way. Um, to Steve and Alex, thanks for your help in um, sort of uh, the design and planning of the RNA-seq experiment. Um, to Sue and Keely in the education office, thank you for making sure I get all my forms back to, week, uh, uh, back to uni mail one time. Um, the WeHi BDO internship, um, the Imnus mentoring program, and my industry mentor, John Grace. Thank you for all your help, um, sort of exploring my interests um, in sort of the business side of science. Um, to all the friends I've met along the way, for all your support. Um, and all the beers and coffees and everything that kind of kept me going through this. And 
lastly to my family. Um, I still don't think they understand what I do when I go to work every day, um, but they've supported me the whole way anyway, um, even though that's been sort of more from afar this year. Um, I really appreciate it and I can't wait to celebrate with you. And lastly, to all the funding bodies uh, that have funded this work, um, ASI, hopefully I'll get to use the travel scholarship at some stage next year. Um, we hire for my, for my PhD stipend, uh, NHMRC, uh, for funding all the research and University of Melbourne and the uh, Department of Education for my, um, uh, for my, my PhD support. And thank you to everyone for listening. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Alyssa, for such a clear presentation. That was really great. We've got some questions coming through. Feel free to keep popping them in, people. But I'll start off with a question from Melissa Call. In the BCL2 transgenic rescue, she asks, what happens to the CD28 staining in the DN4 compartment? Is there an expansion of those DN4 B or C subsets? Um. I haven't really looked at that in terms of the cell numbers, to be honest. Um, it's definitely something I should go back and do. Um, I don't think there's an expansion of the DN4B. We don't actually see any of the DN4B cells get rescued in this mice. So that's the CD28, where they upregulate CD28. Uh, we do still see some DN4C cells, uh, which are the CD28 extra low ones. Um, but yeah, I, I, to be honest, I haven't looked at the actual numbers for these. Yeah, it might be a clue to their differentiation state. So that's an excellent question yeah. if you look at that. Um, Claire asks whether you have any candidate genes that you suspect the spontaneous mutation might be occurring in, uh, in the FAD transgenic mice to drive that lymphoma. Uh, I'm not too sure, um, mostly because we don't know where the, the FAD DN transgenes um, express in the um, like where it's inserted into the genome, but maybe um, probably something uh, I know that Notch is mutated quite often in early, um, sorry, in early T cell um, lymph leukemias quite often. Um, so possibly something like that. Yeah, there was a recent uh, question that just came through on that point. So FAD could inhibit Notch one and allow the DN three cells to differentiate into DN fours, even though they don't express the pre TCR. So I guess the question is. That could FAD be inhibiting NOTCH1? And if so, with a conditional knockout of NOTCH in the DN3s might drive the same phenotype? Yeah, possibly. Um, and NOTCH also um, has, regulates MYC and um, IL-7 receptor signaling as well. So, um, Yeah, they're, they're usually activating mutations in NOTCH associated with TALL, but it's certainly a, a very prominent pathway in that transition. So it's an interesting yeah. one. Um, Murray Lies asked whether the Tregs in those LCMV infected mice change their expression of the, of the BCL2 family of proteins compared to the non-infected mice. Don't yeah. know. We haven't looked at that, but we certainly can. We've got some really nice facts, reagents to look at um, our BCL2 family proteins. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's definitely something we can look at. Yeah. Excellent. And so Ting Ting has a question. Great talk, very enjoyable. Can I know whether you tested the surface or intracellular TCR beta chain in the DP lymphomas that you saw? Um, I haven't looked at that yet. Um, I, most of these lymphomas actually, unfortunately, came down during that first COVID lockdown this year. Um, so I haven't really had a chance to sort of analyse them by facts yet. Um, so when I froze them down, I've got separate vials so I can go back and look at them more by facts and then also for the, the whole exome sequencing. Yeah, although they're all the, the the rag deficiency was a key part of that, right? So yeah, so they right. won't express. Yeah, they won't express TCR beta. Mm, so there's an interesting. Do you want to speculate on what why you think that they also have to lack rag as well? Because it's only the rag knockout fad dominant negatives that get the lymphoma. Yeah, um, it seems to be, and maybe drives like a, some sort of selective pressure or something. Um, so the fad DN transgenic on a wild type background, they develop. Uh, a different malignancy. I can't remember which one, um, but um, yeah, it's certainly for the the thymic lymphoma. It seems to be that that rag knockout is is necessary for um, as some sort of selective pressure for that. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so Phil Hodgkin has a I think it's Phil Hodgkin has an, a question, which is if if you promote viral immunity by dampening T regs, would you also worry about inducing autoimmunity as a consequence? 
Yes. Um, we're hoping that using the inhibitors will sort of, um, obviously like with the MCL1 Tregs, we see that um, we see that those mice die of that, um, that lymphoinfiltrative um, disease. So yes, we, it would be a concern, but we're hoping that just sort of using those inhibitors purely during like an infection state um, sort of limits that. And also because you can control the amount of drug in the system as well. Hopefully the Tregs are sensitive enough that that's not as much of an issue. His attention though, that's a good good response. Uh, Najwa asked whether you know what the level of RIP1 and 3 and MLKL might be in the conventional T cells versus T regs and whether that might explain their differential sensitivity to necroptosis. Yeah, so um, I sort of touched on the MLKL levels in the in the talk, but we do also have um, expression um, of, I think RIP3 is also elevated, particularly, we didn't notice that same um, MLKL level in the, we sorted human and T, T regs and T conventional cells. We didn't notice that MLKL level was different um, in the human PBMCs, um, but we did notice that group three levels were differentially um, differential in those in human T regs versus T conventionals. Mm. And so we might just have time for one last question from Sue Heinzel now. She asks whether you could know or speculate why T regs are more reliant on MCL1 than conventional T cells. So, you know, how and when do they diverge in their reliance upon these different BCL2 family members? Uh, we think it's during uh, di their differentiation in the thymus. Um, so, during that sort of positive negative selection um, phase, T regs diverge from the, the CD4 conventionals then. Um, and they do this, uh, they have a higher level of. Um, of TCR signaling during that positive negative selection um, phase. Um, so they seem to generate MCL1 in response to that, whereas the single positives that differentiate upregulate BCL2. Excellent. Okay, so thanks very much for that, Alyssa. Really excellent Q&A session. Thank you for everyone posted their questions and your attendance today. For those questions we didn't get to, we'll, we'll try and uh, get to those offline. We appreciate your interest. It was a, it was a fantastic session and talk. So um, please join me in thanking Alyssa when you get the chance and uh, we'll see you all around. Thank you very much. Thank you.